In the archive of the photographer Alexander Hamid, there's an extraordinary image of the filmmaker Maya Darren standing behind a pane of glass looking out onto the Los Angeles flatlands below. Situated in the living room of the avant-garde art collector Galka E. Shire, Darren is turned ever so slightly to avoid looking directly at the camera's lens, looking almost at us, but ultimately beyond us. Hamid's camera is positioned obliquely in such a way so that the lens catches the, re the reflection of the building's palms and horizon of Los Angeles and superimposes this image on Darren's figure. As though shot as a double exposure, the slight sideways glance of the camera in its estranging proximity introduces within the image a sense of temporal and spatial displacement, as if to suggest that the entire Los Angeles landscape, its buildings, streets, palms, and sky, was conceived of as an expensive piece of cloth shrouding Darren's person, but also bleeding through the interior of the room. Hamid's photograph shows striking similarities to the famous so-called Botticelli still of Darren taken from the couple's collaborative film, Meshes of the Afternoon from 1943. The still reproduced in countless promotional materials during and after Darren's lifetime <clears throat> shows Darren, her hands and face pressed up against a pane of glass, implicitly pressed, one could assume, against the cinematic screen, standing inside the couple's rented Kings Road home, the still taken at a disjunctive juncture in the film shows Darren looking out toward the world outside, watching her double enter the same house in which she is standing. It is a moment, is a hallucinatory moment of sorts, of both recognition but also misrecognition, an experience of, of a déjà vu, a moment that suggests that the image that Darren and the viewer has just seen and encountered in reality has already been seen and encountered in a dream. In a certain respect, Darren and Hamid's Botticelli still acts as a formal pivot within the film, a moment of calm in the midst of a storm of confusing activity and disorientation. Just as Darren and Hamid's Botticelli still functions as a psychological pivot in the film, it is my contention that Hamid's photograph of Darren with, within Shire's home acts as a formal pivot within the couple's small body of collaborative work a point where social and psychological worlds come together in disorienting and dislocating ways. Although Darren and Hamid occupy an important place in the history of avant-garde film, noted for the collaboration, of course, of Meshes of the Afternoon, the photographic work of the same period, sometimes collaborative, sometimes not, appears not only as a blind spot in their work, but also within the history of photography and avant-garde activity in America. Well, Darren and Hamid were both recent arrivals to Los Angeles. In the city, Darren worked as a secretary and editor for the avant-garde dancer, Catherine Dunham. Born in Kiev in 1917, the same year as the Russian Revolution, Darren's family lived an exceptional existence for Russian Jews at the time. The family lived in the city, which was rare, and Darren's mother and father were both highly educated doctors. Despite the family's financial and political importance, the Darrens were eventually forced to flee Russia in 1922 due to the deteriorating social conditions in the country of the time. Now, in America, and before moving to Los Angeles, Darren studied journalism and English literature at Syracuse University, Smith College, and NYU. And in the mid-1930s, her cultural and political activity during this period was rich, organizing an informal socialist training school in upstate New York in 1937, and later collaborating on the writing of an unpublished detective novel with her stepmother, Amelia Muriel Duran, entitled Double or Nothing. 1940. Through Dunham's connections, Darren would marry, <coughs> would meet and later marry Alexander Hamid, an avant-garde filmmaker and photographer from Czechoslovakia, who had recently arrived to California as an exile of war. Barely escaping the Nazi occupation of Prague in 1938, he had previously worked for the American filmmaker Her Herbert Klein on two feature-length films, Crisis from 1938 and Lights Out in Europe, 1939 which documented Nazi occupation and aggression in Czechoslovakia and Poland. When Hamid arrived in Los Angeles, he was financially supported by working on the John Steinbeck scripted documentary, The Forgotten Village, 1940, but also, was also supported by Klein, who gave him one third of his studio salary. Despite his training and, and connections, Hamid was restricted from joining the Hollywood Filmmakers Union. A few months after Darren and Hamid met, Darren would leave the Dunham Dance Company and the couple would move in together in a small apartment in Laurel Canyon. As a recently married couple, 
Darren and Hammond were invited by Klein to travel to Mexico to work on his anti-fascist film, Five Were Chosen, about the Nazi occupation of a small village in Yugoslavia. When Darren and Hammond tried to cross the U.S.-Mexican border in Laredo, Texas, they were denied passage because Darren was subject to an ongoing FBI internal security investigation into her association with communist organizations in New York and her family's Russian immigrant, immigrant background. When the couple was called in for questioning, they quickly realized that their hotel phone was bugged and their activities were under surveillance. Stranded in Laredo, Texas, without money or guaranteed visa, the couple decided to sell their car, pack up their equipment, and travel back to Los Angeles by train. It is during the winter and spring months of 1942-43, a period of intense romance but also financial stress, that Darren and Hamid would experiment with the forms of photography, a period of study, experimentation, and occasional collaboration that lasted six months. Now, according to Hamid, the couple would spend their time driving around Los Angeles, to, quote, just looking at things. Now, Hamid's flippant account belies the complexity and ambition of the photographs that were shot during the, this short six-month period. Now, some photographs were included in a solo exhibition that the photographer had participated in at the Pasadena Art Institute in January 15, 1943, an exhibition that, to this day, the museum nor Hamid's archive has any record of. The ones shot in the months before the couple filmed meshes were not, and the many more photographs composed in downtown Los Angeles, Texas, and Mexico, especially photographs shot by Hamid of Herbert Klein suspended in mid-flight on a Texas sand dune, have never seen the light of day, neither exhibited nor reproduced in publication. Now, in a sense, Darren and Hamid's short collaborative encounter can be understood through three interrelated projects. Experimental Portraits, 1942, a series of erotic portraits taken on the beaches and interiors of Greater Los Angeles. L.A. Reportage, a collection of photographs shot primarily by Darren throughout the city's downtown core. And Fruit Pickers, a series of photographs of itinerant Latino farm workers pictured inside and outside the vast fat fruit pa packing sheds of the city. The photographs that the duo shot together for experimental portraits suggest a blurring of boundaries between street and interior, nature and culture, self and other. The shuttling between genres, conventions, and subjectivities continually mobilizes a sense of dislocation and disassociation that courses through Darren and Hammond's work. This talk will address the aesthetic maneuvers of displacement undertaken by Darren and Hammond that bind their practice to the fraught and particular time and space of intimacy and exile in Los Angeles in the 1940s. My argument here is that the duo's photographic work from this period, a type of work ranging from erotic portraiture to social reportage, should be interpreted as an intricate constellation of tensions and contradictions, a mode of work beset by unexpected jumps, night moves, and strange leaps in subject and style. This experimental condition is a condition of displacement of one's experience, a condition of not belonging, of not being at home in one's genre or, or mode. The roots of this displaced condition are found much earlier, earlier in a number of photographs Hamid takes as an exile of war under protective arrest of the French government when the photographer was forced to flee occupied Czechoslovakia in 1939. Only months before, Hamid had collaborated with Klein on the anti-fascist documentary Crisis, one of the first films, of course, to document Nazi violence and aggression in Europe. One photograph shot in Paris shows the Church of the Madeleine reflected through a pane of glass with a large and ominous head of a paint chip doll or mannequin pictured almost laughing, superimposed on this darkened image of a man shot in profile Purdue or lost profile. Now, similar to Hamid's photograph of Darren, staged a few years later in the home of Galka Shire, the image is a complicated palimpsest of street, building, and figure crowned by the neoclassical pediment showing the second coming of Christ and the last judgment an image that still persists, persists to this day, albeit in an altered form with the face of a Ralph Lauren model now standing in for the paint ship mannequin. Now, one could perhaps speculate on Hamid's thoughts as an enemy alien under protective arrest as he stood on the sidewalk, held his camera at waist length, and looked up at this static image of the Last Judgment as a figure crosses him and his camera. The image almost suggests that the glories of history can only be approached obliquely through a displaced and sideways glance. A tilted and oblique perspective, I should note, 
that is mobilized by Hamid days later when he photographs the dramatically pruned and leafless trees of the suburb of Orleans from a tilted perspective of a worm's eye view. A glance that is dedicated to what Siegfried Krakauer once called the fleeting shadows of the present. Photography's magnetic attraction to, to indeterminate fragments, contingent encounters, and inter intermittent palimpsests of subject and object. Three years later, these oblique angles and perspectives are echoed throughout Darren's own series, L.A. Reportage. Indeed, in the series, we also find traces of a distinctive eschatological stance and subject matter featured in Darren's photograph of the famous Angel's Flight funicular railway in Bunker Hill, the Jesus Save sign on the roof of the Church of the Open Door, and the many allusions to tainted souls, the Seventh Commandment, and other transgressions of the flesh in Darren's photograph of the city's downtown signage. Now, Darren's eschatological stance is by no means coincidental to Los Angeles. The great social historians of the city of the 1930s and 40s, Kerry McWilliams, Louis Adamack, and Sarah Comstock, all drew on figures of the apocalypse and the afterlife, endless metaphors and false prophets, heretics and millennial hucksters to account for the city's eccentric fabric. McWilliams' own methodology, what he called a type of frontier eschatology, repeatedly cited the writings of Nathaniel West, whose own literary method he described as the apocalypse of the second hand, the second hand being the monstrous excesses of the outmoded and the obsolete, a method which served as ample fodder for West's comically farcical novel, Day of the Locust, a novel where West imagines the destruction of Los Angeles through the eyes of an outsider, the Yale-educated painter, Todd Hackett. Now, figures of alienation and ambiguity have become somewhat cliche in the histories of photography. Recall Walter Benjamin's reflections on surrealism and photography as one that establishes a healthy alienation between environment and man, or Siegfried Krakauer's claim that history resembles photography, that it, it, in it that it is, he writes, among other things, a means of alienation. And yet, Darren's photographs of downtown Los Angeles, when viewed through this lens of displacement, migration, and frontier eschatology, gives added credence to Alan Sekula's posthumously published argument that social documentary in the previous century persisted in Los Angeles marginally and cryptically as a mode, he says, of zombie realism, a documentary mode, to quote Sekula, where the living speaks only through the dead or through those states of being that fall between life and death. Along a parallel trajectory, this zombie condition, a representational mode that falls between life and death, a mode that fuses eschatological forms with states of exile and migration, resonates throughout the emigre literature of the 1940s Los Angeles. The principal text that comes to mind is Theodore Adorno's Minima Moralia, a text partially written in Los Angeles, which frames the life of the exile and emigre as a form of damaged life. Adorno conveys this damaged condition through the language of physical, social, and psychic ruin. Life is cast astray, he writes. The city seems incomprehensible. It is a space of non-belonging. Language has been expropriated, and the knowledge that the subject once possessed is tapped dry. Relations between outcasts, he states, are even more poisoned than between long-standing residents. Here, private life asserts itself like an undead substance, unduly, hectically, vampire-like, trying convulsively to prove it is alive because it really no longer exists. Now, Adorno was not alone in his migration to Southern California. Approximately 10 to 15,000 refugees traveled to Southern California between 1933 and 1941 to flee the political and racial persecution brought about with the rise of Adolf Hitler. These figures include Bertolt Brecht, Helena Weigel, Arnold Schoenberg, and Adorno's close collaborator, Max Horkheimer. Now, for Adorno and Hammond and many others forced to flee the barbarism of fascism, California made for a contradictory place of exile, at once idyllic and alienating Mediterranean, but also a desert, a landscape open to possibilities, but also 3,000 miles away from the center of culture in New York. In Los Angeles, Adorno shuddered at the prospect of the comforts of exile while fascism and war expanded across Europe. For Adorno, Adorno, the exile's displaced position resonated most clearly in the experience within the home and its contemporary resonances 
with the barbarism of fascism on the one hand and capitalism on the other. At this moment of displacement and homelessness, in which Adorno himself experienced quite acutely in Los Angeles, the theorist concluded that it is, to quote, part of morality not to be at home in one's home. This condition is extended, too, to writers and intellectuals. Writing becomes a place to live for those who no longer have a homeland. And yet, Adorno comes to the conclusion, regretfully, that the writer in exile is ultimately unable to live in their own writing. It is in this context of forced exile and migration where Adorno would conclude that life in the 1940s, situated precariously between the violence of industrial capitalism and fascism, was untenable. Wrong life cannot be lived rightly, he says. Well, Darren and Hamid's work is one place to complicate this historical account. The contention here is not that their work from this period merely reflects the canonical accounts of exile, but often their work can be read as embracing this damaged and split condition by pushing back against it, sometimes enthusiastically, at other moments ambiguously, working through the wild oscillations of intimacy and estrangement that beset one's life. Enigmatically, this peculiar knot of forms, a knot of splits, cleavages, and other modes of bodily metamorphosis and dissolution was actively channeled by Darren and Hamid in numerous portraits that the couple staged within their home, but also within the home of Galka E. Shire. Shire herself was an emigre, not an exile, and her home was purposely built by Richard Neutra, another emigre, to show her impressive collection of the work of Paul Clay, Lionel Feininger, Vasily Kandinsky, and other members of the European avant-garde who were forced into exile in 1933 and later classified by fascist cultural policy as degenerate. One of the more remarkable photographs from their collection includes a group portrait of Shire, Hamid, and Darren shot in Shire's upstairs bathroom. On the far right corner of the image is Shire's posed leaning up against the bathroom wall with her dog Tuffy at her side. At the center, Darren is reflected in a mirror, looking away from the camera's lens. And on the far left of the image, Hamid is pictured without a face, his camera held at waist height, pictured da split down the middle by a severe cut of the mirror, a condition that appears to cleave Hamid's human subjectivity, but also enliven it with a snaking botanical form that envelops and entangles with his person. Concerning this question of multiplication and superimposition, one could also consider, perhaps, Hamid's photograph of the avant-garde dancer and emigre, Rita Cristiani, pictured through the strategy of double exposure, an intimate but estranging view of the subject as a layered and blurred palimpsest. Again, this collection of photographs and images forces the question, what are we to make of all these palimpsests, splits, cleavages, and superimpositions? How do we make sense of the mirror's distorted surface, its polymorphous mode of perception, that fuses subject and thing, sometimes into a liquefied substance, at other moments a distinctive and jarring projection. Well, in his posthumous publication, History, The Last Things Before the Last, Siegfried Krakar addressed the strange quality of experience, a palimpsest of intimacy and estrangement, as the principal experience of the exile. Well, sometimes life itself produces palimpsest, Krakar writes, a stranger to the world evoked by the sources the subject, which is to say the historian in Krakauer's case, is faced with the task, the exile's task, of penetrating its outward appearances so that they may learn to understand that world from within." End quote. In the hands of Darren and Hamid, photography and film was tasked to work through this damaged form, which was symptomatic of life and experience in the 1940s. It is through this extraterritorial experience of self-effacement that the historian is capable of communing with the material. This type of self-effacement is, of course, different to the form of self-effacement that Walter Benjamin criticizes in the work of the historian Leopold von Runke for desiring to teleport back into the past in order to tell history objectively as it really was. The nature of Krakauer's self-effacement is not voluntaristic in this sense, but a product of the historical condition of exile. Darren, too, would remark upon the psychological effects of displacement and disorientation, recognition and misrecognition in a number of poems penned in the early 1940s as a member of the Dunham Dance Company. She quotes, It must be done with mirrors, one poem reads, my head that rests on nothing in midair. Where is my body? Where, oh, where? I can see the stones hidden in the hands. Oh, bring back my body to me. Oh, miracle it back before the mirror breaks. <laughs> 
Later, in a poem dedicated to Anis Nin, a collaborator of Darren's in her film, Ritual of Transfigured Time, Darren characterizes the mirror as a violent, insatiable, and all-consuming force. Indeed, the mirror was no longer a mirror, but something else, projection, something corporeal and painful, an open wound. In one sense, we are closer in thinking through the photographic effects of dissolution and disassociation rendered figuratively in a number of photographs taken by Darren and Hammond in the early 1940s, most notably figured in one photograph composed by Darren of a naked Hammond, Hammond <clears throat> holding a broken mirror that is also reflected and mirrored in the foreground of the image, an image which dramatizes in turn the experience of bodily dispersion, disquieting anxiety, and fugue-like states and effects that is characteristic of their film meshes, but also Darren and Hammond's early photographic work on the whole. The broken mirror that Hammond holds is perhaps the same mirror that is later repurposed in Darren and Hammond's tall and slender hooded mirror figure who wanders through meshes, always eluding Darren's approach. Now, along this line of thinking, a line that marked by a series of tensions between recognition and misrecognition, association and disassociation, wounds and fugue-like states, my argument is forced to address this peculiar knot of eros and thanatos, life drives and death drives that pulses through meshes, the strange encounter of Darren's person, multiplied and disoriented, encountering herself at the table, an effect that was rendered masterfully with Darren and Hammond blocking out one section of the film with a piece of paper and tape, which was later rewound and uncovered, the exposed section subsequently covered, and the unexposed film exposed with Darren now occupying seamlessly the other side of the frame. And yet this image of disorientation is quickly upended in meshes, where Darren is figured aggressively as a knife-wheeling, bobble-eyed murderer of her own sleeping body. At the end of the film, just when we think Darren has woke from her dream and is visited by Hamid, Darren throws a knife at his face, which both transforms his profile into a broken mirror, um, but also shatters it, scattering its broken pieces on the shores of a beach. Um, a scene later, this same mirror is found again, also dispersed within the interior of the couple's home as we cast our eyes on Darren's corpse, soaking wet, draped with seaweed, and with what looks like the floatsam and jetsam of a wreckage. <clears throat> The intimate proximity of Darren in the bits and pieces of the sea constitutes the principal motif of the final sequence. Here we encounter, sorry, maybe, sorry. Here Darren encounters the life forms of the ocean, transforming her own death into a second skin, an image not of a Botticellian ideal, but of an unwieldy excess. Darren's entanglement with the detritus and matter of the sea is mythically recalibrated later in the opening sequence for her second film, At Land, where Darren emerges miraculously from the ocean through reverse motion. Now in the sequence, waves crash not upon the shore, but back onto itself. And in the wake, Darren appears wide-eyed and glistening, relishing not only in her corporeal resurrection, but also taking dizzying pleasure in the realization of cinema's new powers and capacities. Film's power and capacity to forge a new relation to time and history, an image not of death, but of the afterlife. As a way of a conclusion of sorts, I want to pause and recall that when Anis Nin first encountered Darren, it was by chance while Darren and Hamid were filming this very scene on a desolate beach in Long Island. And in a diary en entry penned on August 1945, <coughs> Nin writes of watching from afar a woman repeatedly being tossed by waves toward the shore. She recalls being puzzled at the sight, but notably no words were exchanged between Nin Hamid or Darren during the encounter. A year later, when Darren and, and Nin had officially met, Darren and, Hamid's, in a, Darren and Hamid's apartment in the West Village during a screening of, of Atland, she had recognized the image and Darren immediately. Now what is peculiar, however, is how Nin frames this encounter with Darren in her diary. It follows immediately after Nin's entry on the bombing of Hiroshima. She writes, a horror to stun the world, unbelievable barbarism. And book ending her account of meeting Darren on the shores of Long Island, Nin concludes with another catastrophe. She writes, a second bomb dropped on Nagasaki. This is savagery of such scale, I cannot believe it. Now what is striking about this anecdote are the dates in Nin's diary. The entry was penned on August 1945, and yet Darren filmed at land in the summer of 1944, and according to Darren's ledger, 
Hammond and Darren first entertained Nin in July 1945, a month before the United States government dropped the first bomb on Hiroshima, August 6, and the second on Nagasaki, August 9th. Whether Nin unconsciously misremembers these dates and her first encounter with Darren, or whether it was an act of self-conscious mythology and autofiction, is besides the point. Her brief anecdote dramatizes how, in the 1940s, a moment of extraordinary political and social upheaval of war, exile, and senseless barbarism, a personal history and friendship was intricately folded within the most unthinkable and, un and unspeakable catastrophes. That's, that's it. Thank you. I just have a really simple technical question. I know that in their films they're using a lot of double exposures rather intricately, as, as you've explained. I didn't know this masking of the film in order to mm. have the double, which is amazing. But in the photographs, I'm, are most of them done through material manipulation and not double exposure? I know there are some double exposures, but a lot of them seem to be through mirrors or having physical objects obscured. And I'm sort of fascinated by their decision not to use the kind of magic of photography hmm. to create these effects. My, my only, I think there's a, only the Christiani portrait. Yeah. That, that, I think that's a double exposure mm -hmm. or if not a layering of two photographs. It's probably a double, yeah. Yeah, and then, um, but mostly it's, it is this, Mirrors this yeah, like seen through, yeah. you know, um, a window, whether it's Shire's. Uh, home, the interior of Shire's home, or on the, you know, on, on the sidewalk, yeah. the street. Um, but yeah, it's not typically through... Through um, photographic technique. Mm, I mm. think that's just fascinating. Mm. I don't know what to read from it, but um, yeah. So that was just amusing. I had. Yeah, thank you. That's a terrific paper. Um, can, you, can you say something about the sort of temporality of these films? That's, you'll see there's some overlap with what... Um, comes up in my photographs, but um, uh, in terms of filmically, um, how they're using uh, editing and stop action, freeze frame, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, and the way in which that might map onto or intersect with the kinds of displacements, um, psychological disruptions that you're that you're pointing that so, you're analyzing. Yeah, she always like Darren when she like. In numerous um, articles and essays about her films, um, which is always really fascinating to read because it's like you know quite soon after she finishes a mm -hmm. film, she's trying to like theoretically work yeah. through what right. you know she's doing alongside Hamid, mm -hmm. and this notion of time and temporality. She's always describing um, film and its capacity to obviously create a new reality, but also to mm -hmm. extend time. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. and she's um, so it's extending time, but there's also thinking through this notion of simultaneity. Mm -hmm. So at land, she emerges from the ocean in reverse motion, right, it's mythically. Right. But then at the end of the film, when she's picking up all of these rocks, um, she's like running on the shores of the beach. Mm -hmm. And then while she's, you know, engaging in this action, all of the subsequent scenes that she was um, mm -hmm. you know, she, she was filmed with an interior or another space is, you know, cut magically. You know, it cut in this way that all of this, this, the the kind of the mm -hmm. scenes are, or the scenes are happening simultaneously. Mm -hmm. simultane simultaneously. Simultaneously. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, thinking through this, and also a new notion of time, whether mm -hmm. it's relativity or. Um, but yeah, it's. Yeah, that's maybe, fascinating. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the paper. It's um, it was really uh, exciting to hear. But it seems like you're putting the emphasis on the divisions and, and the fracturing of the pictorial space, specifically with the condition of exile and immigration. But I'm wondering, given that I think there are some surrealist um, references, um, mm -hmm. that there's not really also the question about a split and divided subject that can be thought of in gender terms, can be thought of in um, profoundly psychic terms, but doesn't exclusively need to be indexed to the um, circumstances of exile and um, um, being out of one's own place. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I would, I, I feel somewhat, um, 
like hesitant to have the, the reading of exile overdetermine the, the interpretation of these photographs. And I think maybe I'll, you know, pare that back a bit. Um, the, this notion of, I, I, you know, I would also agree with you, the, the, the notion of surrealism is, is complicated because, um, you know, Darren would always resist any sort of interpretation of her, her works, her films, along a surrealist lens. Um, but of course it's like, it's, but you know, it's, it's working with notions of the uncanny, um, as well as... Fetishism. Pardon me? Fetishism. Fe yeah, of course. Doubling. Doubling, the mannequin. Um, and that also, like, maybe also was one way we can think of, um, you know, Hamid's placement within um, this collaboration as well. Um, I think that's, um, and, but I'm also struck by this notion of this, the, the deja vu or what have you, which is not the de, deja vu, which she also like aligns her project with. And she's like, okay, this, this meshes is, um, one way to think of it is this, you know, this experience of deja vu as like already seen, but the deja vu is somewhat more troubling, which is already dreamed, right? So it's this, you, what you see in reality is what you've seen in a dream, right? And so this may, may be another way to think through um, this experience of misrecognition or, you know, the unconscious or th this dream-like state or dream-like work, which kind of pulses through their work. Um, but yeah, that's... I, I, <laughs> that's yeah. What, what do they do with language? The, the, sure. it's, the, the film is silent. Um, completely silent. Completely silent. <laughs> and only later um, does uh, Darren's third husband, um, Teji Ito, he composes a number of soundtracks in the 50s, which are later um, combined with meshes. So it's, um, and the soundtrack is phenomenal, but it's, th th these films are silent. Um, so, yeah. any, other, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Sure. I, I, it's a new world, but fascinating one for me. So, thank you. Thank you.